I'm Connie Young Yu, and um, I have a pioneer background uh, in America from both sides of my family. And I think that what I've been trying to establish as a writer and historian is that, um, you know, Chinese Americans have, you know, inherited this whole history of struggle against exclusion. And this has been passed on to all Asians in, in this country, the concept that we're perpetual foreigners. And that this begins with the, the Chinese exclusion law of 1882. And my personal story is this, and it's, I'll tell you the San Jose story. My grandfather, uh, Yong Sung Wong, he was born in Canton, uh, a small village in Canton. And at the age of 11, he begged to come to, to America uh, with his uncle, who has already had some business, was very fortunate, uh, was living in uh, San Jose's Chinatown. And he had gone back to the village to visit, and he had the opportunity to come back. And, and this was 1881, when there was no exclusion law against Chinese. And my grandfather had a chance to, to come at the age of 11 as an 11 year old laborer. And he came to the Market Street Chinatown. And, um, and it was a very bustling big Chinatown. And um, uh, it was home base to all the agricultural workers in the valley, Santa Clara Valley. I mean, the, the primary labor force in California, you know, before the, the exclusion law was Chinese workers. So anyway, this wonderful Chinatown was um, where the Fairmont Hotel is now in San Jose. And I think it's important to know, because this is, I think that I'm trying to teach that the roots of, of your, of history, you know, look, look for the roots in your own community. And we're talking about Santa Clara County, Santa Clara County students. Um, anyway, my grandfather worked in the Chinatown and, um, and then when he, Whenever he left the Chinatown to go to work, he worked as a houseboy and later he made bricks. He, he worked on a strawberry farm. Whenever he left the Chinatown, he'd have to run really fast because he'd worry that, you know, he'd be chased by hoodlums, you know. And then one time when he was running back to Chinatown, some, some kids, who were, they were probably older hoodlums, threw rocks at him and he lost his hat. And that, that's a story that was passed down to us. And I thought about my, my poor grandpa at the age of 12 running, you know, for his life back to home base, which was Barker Street, Chinatown. And the story is this, and you probably know this if you've been to downtown San Jose, there's, um, there's a plaque at the Fairmont Hotel, which says on this site, the, one of the largest Chinatowns in California was burned to the ground by arson. So in 1887, my grandfather was a refugee you know, running, you know, because the Chinatown was burned to the ground. I mean, and this was after the exclusion law and after this whole atmosphere of, of uh, anti-Chinese policies. Um, and that established, the exclusion law established that Chinese would be perpetual foreigners if they can't be naturalized as citizens. And this is important for, for you know, this is American history. And this is why this is what was inherited by immigrants up to this day. The idea that you're, you're foreigners, you're really, you can't be American, you know. So uh, that was the exclusion law was repealed in 1943. But for 61 years, this was American policy. Chinese could not be naturalized as citizens. So that left a, a huge um, you know, void in our history because all the achievements of Chinese was, you know, that's not important. It's not a part of American history. And that includes the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, which was largely built by the, um, the backs of, of Chinese, 10 to 15 Chinese, uh, thousand Chinese railroad workers. Now on my mother's side, my great grandfather, Li Wang Sang was one of the Chinese railroad workers that came in 1866. And he worked on the railroad. He was very, 
very fortunate because after the completion in 1869, he was able to come back to San Francisco, become a, a shopkeeper and a merchant, and you know was able to send for his wife and had a, um, a family. My grandfather was born in San Francisco. My mother was born in San Francisco. I was born in LA. Uh, on my father's side, my grandfather who fled the, the San Francisco, uh, he fled to San Francisco after the fire and lived there for a few years. And I have his certificate of residence. And this, if you can see it, this is, part of the paper trail in our family. My grandfather had to carry this, this certificate to prove that he was legally in this country as a Chinese laborer because he came before 1881. This is because of the Geary Act and it required that all Chinese carry a photo passport to show that they were legally in this country. That was part of the exclusion law. So. You can see his picture. I hope you, there, there's my grandpa. And it says San Francisco, gives his address at San Francisco. But fortunately, a few years later, so this was in, this picture was taken in uh, 1894. A few years later, my grandfather was able to come back to San Jose, to the new Chinatown that was built um, where Japantown is now. Because a man called John Heinlein bravely, you know, in opposition to all the, the people in the city, he said, I will lease land for a new Chinatown. So that is the, the site of the, the Chinatown is Japantown now in San Jose. And um, the reason why it faded, that there's no Chinatown now is because of the exclusion law. Gradually, you know, the, the population diminished, Chinese laborers couldn't come to, and Japanese workers took over you know, uh, were able to come in. And, um, but still my grandfather and my grandmother stayed in that Chinatown till the 1930s. They raised a family. This is a picture of my grandfather and my grandmother. And there's my dad as a little boy. He was born in 1912 and his brother in 1910. And they went to integrated schools but they lived in this gated Chinatown with a fence around it, but um, they had an opportunity for a new start. So, and both sides of my family contributed their labors to America. They, they um, became, you know, um, you know, hardworking people, <laughs> you know, the first generation that couldn't become citizens, but their children were citizens and they, they were achievers and, and, you know, all fields, they were able to, um, still facing, you know, the glass ceiling, like my father was trained as an engineer, but uh, couldn't get a job as an engineer in the 30s and 40s and um, uh, served as an officer in World War II, served his country um, and came back and became a soy sauce manufacturer and a businessman and, and my mother, um, you know, became a you know community volunteer and an artist, and they both uh, you know contrib contributed and donated their communities. Sort of a hair, something I've inherited. So, but they were constantly telling me that you know Chinese, you have to be better. You have to try harder. You have to show that you know, uh, which is really very sad that we had to be the model minority in order to be accepted and. Uh, uh, and this is what, um, you know, we're facing today, this, this um, I think the roots of the anti-Asian hate, um, you know, go back to the Chinese exclusion law, of course, and, and back to the, the way the Japanese Americans were regarded during World War II as, as uh, uh, enemy aliens. So um, it just left this constant, and also the fact that our history our curriculum has never really, well, until now, has never really grappled with this, um, the, the immigration laws and the injustices on, on minorities because of, of uh, a nativist attitude and uh, the establishment of, of who is a foreigner. And this goes back to uh, the, the gold rush days 
when one of the first laws that the state legislature of California enacted was the law that said blacks, uh, Negroes, mulatto, and Indians are not allowed to testify against a white person, which deprives this whole group of civil rights. In 1854, the law was extended to Chinese. Chinese could not testify because that was one of the largest populations of, you know, of minorities in California. They could not testify. And this was not repealed for almost 30 years. So you have this, this background of, of, um, of legalized, institutionalized racism because of exclusion, because of uh, unequal laws, you know, for the, the courts. And um, it affected, you know, subsequent legislation in every single city, every single municipality in the United States, like the alien land laws. The alien land laws in California said, um, declared that this was in 19, passed in 1913, declared that no aliens ineligible for citizenship are allowed to own land. Now who's ineligible for citizenship but Asians? So, you know, it extended from the Chinese to the Japanese to the Filipinos to people of color. So that, uh, that really uh, segregated our society. So um, I wanted to say that the Asian communities struggled, they, um, they resisted, and they, they brought as much culture to their, their lives as, as, as possible. They became, um, let's say, they became citizens in their own right, you know, whether they were, could be naturalized or not. And so I just wanted to show you this picture of the first generation of, of Chinese Americans in Heinlandville, Chinatown. So this, is, this was given to me by one of the former residents. And you see, this is 1895. And it shows how early the Chinese were here in establishing their communities. But people will say, well, we didn't know anything about this. We didn't see, there's no trace of it. And I said that's because of the exclusion law and that wiped out Chinatowns. And um, um, also prevented the uh, new immigrants from coming in. And so many of the, let's say the majority of Asians, especially Chinese, came, are, are descendants of people who came after the exclusion law. After, in fact, after 1956, which was uh, the naturalization and immigration law that was signed by President Johnson that eliminated racial discrimination and the, the quota system. So um, this, this really is important to know because a lot of new residents or new immigrants who come, they say, well, we don't know this history. We didn't feel this background, but suddenly we're, we're you know, because of this new surge in anti-Asian hate, we suddenly we're targeted even as uh, perpetual in foreigners. Do you like go back to where you came from? People are saying, go back to where you came from. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, you caused the, the Kung flu. So, um, it's very important for, for everybody to, to know this background, but also the one positive thing that's come out of all of this, this strife, is a feeling of solidarity, a feeling of uh, that, that we, we're, we're in this together. We're regarded, you know, um, you know as the same, and we need to, to resist together. Um, so... I was part of the, the series called Asian Americans on PBS, and it gave, gives the history of the different, you know, Asian groups 
from you know Filipino to Chinese to Korean, Vietnamese, Cambodian, um, East Asian, and um, Manong people, all um, you know, all who are regarded. You know, people look, you know, white people look at them and they go, "Oh, you're you're from somewhere else. You know, you you don't belong here." So. Um, the series, you know, talked about the history and the struggle and also, you know, that uh, uh, it's inspiring to know that, that we have the struggle, common struggle and that we can do something to, um, to help our society by telling this history because this history belongs in American history. This is our American narrative. It is how we, uh, peoples who've come here have struggled sometimes against each other, sometimes uh, asserting themselves over each other. Certainly the white supremacy that has suppressed the, the indigenous people and, and sorted all these exclusion laws and deciding who's a foreigner, who should, who should uh, have jobs, who should uh, be own land. Um, this, um, it's, it's like America's been in this, this struggle that it hasn't really recognized until today where we have to face, it's come to this point. This is the telling moment. This is, um, let's say, it's a, uh, a crisis moment, but also one of great opportunity and recognition. So, um, you know, I feel that, you know, for my role, I, I love to tell the stories of, of the pioneers that I've known, uh, know about, and um, the book that I, help edit is called Voices from the Railroad, which is uh, stories from descendants of Chinese railroad workers. And um, I helped to organize an exhibit, which is at Hakoni Gardens. It's called Hakoni and Executive Order 9066. And these are stories told by um, our friends, you know, two of the trustees of Hakoni who talk about their families and their incarceration during World War II in um, Japanese, what they call concentration camps. Um, there were 10 of them across the, the country, uh, the Western part of the country. And a lot of people do not know this history and they themselves did not feel, you know, comfortable talking about it. It was so painful until in recent years, and it's a younger generation who say, we want to know, we want to know this history, we should tell it, we should tell it, and uh, to, um, to help us understand our past so we can go forward. 